Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. Tonight, the Senate passes a $1.5 trillion funding bill that keeps the government running until September. Consumer Price Index said that we now have inflation up to almost 8%, which is the worst in 40 years. And Russian forces intensify strikes on western Ukraine cities. We'll have that and more on this Friday, March the 11th, 2022. Hi and welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up. I'm Andre Laborde. I hope your week went well. Coming up tonight, the CPI reports inflation for the last year is up 7.9%. Oil is up over 65% from last year, and the United States is closing down all oil sales coming in from Russia. But the good news is Amazon is splitting their stock 20 to 1 shares. We'll explain more about that in detail later on in the show. But coming up tonight, we're going to be talking with Morgan Stanley's Jim Spiro. Now, Jim has almost 40 years of experience as a wealth advisor with over $2.8 billion of assets under management. Now, he's seen lots of these stock market gyrations, and we'll be talking with Jim. We'll this in just a minute. And we're going to find out how should we maybe balance or rebalance our portfolios and maybe even talk us off the ledge, too. But first, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with their consumer price index for measuring inflation, and it was worse than expected. Last month for February, inflation rose over the year by almost 8 percent, which is the highest since 1982, 40 years ago. From last February of 2021, gasoline is now up over 38 percent. Used cars and trucks are up over 40 percent. Electricity up 9 percent. In many parts of the country, these items are up even more than these numbers I'm giving you. And the price of a barrel of oil closed today at $109 a barrel for the April delivery. One year ago on this day, it was just $66 a barrel. That's a 65 percent increase from last year. Well, this week, the president canceled oil sales from Russia, which reduced our imports. The majority still comes from Canada and Mexico. But to think that 13 months ago, we had stopped importing oil and were actually exporting this commodity. It boggles the mind. Well, it was another down week for stocks. All the S&P sectors closed lower, with the S&P and the NASDAQ indexes ended lower for the fourth straight week in a row. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average had their fifth straight weekly loss. The week the Dow Jones ended at 32,943. It was down 2 percent for the week. And the S&P closed at 4,204, down 2.8 percent for the week. And the NASDAQ, they ended at 12,843, down just over 3.5% for the week. So let's get to our guest this evening. Jim Spiro is the managing director at Morgan Stanley. He was named best in Louisiana by Forbes magazine, and Barron's magazine has named Jim one of the top 100 wealth advisors in the nation. And best of all, he's here with us tonight. Hi, Jim. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up. Hi, Andre. Nice to be with you. Thanks for having me along. Always a pleasure, my friend. Jim, this week, consumer price indexes came out with the year-to-year -year inflation now rising to 7.9 percent, just basically almost 8 percent. So with 8 percent almost inflation, we've got this month also looks like interest rates are going to be rising at least a, a quarter of a percent, 25 yep. basis points. Yep. For investors, how do you think they should react to all this news? Well, I guess a couple of things, Andre. Uh, one is that, remember, when you make an investment in, in a stock, you own a piece of a business. Uh, and uh, obviously, higher interest rates, higher inflation, and so on and so forth, it's not helpful, but you want to realize that the country has faced situations like in the, this in the past, difficult times. And if you go back over the last 30, 50, 100 years, you'll see that the market has managed to work its way through and still have an annualized rate of return over those periods of time. And you can pick 30, 50, or 100. It's still around 8.5 to 9 percent. I think you might have some rocky times here along the way. I think it might be akin to a pilot uh, telling its passengers, look, uh, we're about to go through some turbulence here. There's a storm up ahead. I'll try to work my way around it. I may or may not be able to do so. And I think in the coming months, the range of outcomes is probably broader than it historically uh, has been. 
uh, but not all the time. But it depends what an investor, uh, what an investor's portfolio looks like, and what he or she is trying to accomplish. If their goals are for more than, I'll just pull a figure out, a year, two years, five years, will all this have any effect? What I guess I'm, I'm looking at what type of a goal of a long, what's long term, and what is short term. Well, I think if you're in the stock market, inherently, you shouldn't be looking at less than five years and out. So if, you, if you're in the stock market and you're looking at a, a, a period shorter than that, then I think there's a fundamental disconnect between what, what you're trying to do and what the stock market offers. Uh, the stock market, as I told you, is an investment in a business. Uh, it's no different from owning a travel agency or a restaurant or a gas station. And you wouldn't get valuations for a person owning a travel agency. The person wouldn't get valuations on a daily basis, independent of the, the cost to get the valuation. So uh, the, these, these must be looked at not as racetrack bets, which unfortunately is what a lot of people do, and look at what they really are, which is owning pieces of businesses. And over time, businesses, if they're well run, grow and prosper. And, and if you own sound fundamental companies, you should grow and prosper and benefit accordingly with them. Too few people say think that the stocks is just as a as a, a day trading tool or a monthly trading tool. You're yeah. in one morning and you're out by that afternoon or, yeah. or whatever the case. And anybody who owns a business knows that, you know, businesses like life go up and down. People who are trying to day trade and so on and so forth, they're obviously succumbing to the desire to make a quick buck. And anyone has the desire. I would, too. But if there were ways to make a quick buck, uh, everyone would eventually know about them, and the market wouldn't offer the returns it offers. The reason the market offers the returns it offers, and historically has offered, and I believe in the years to come will offer, is because of this risk associated with it. If there were no risk, if you could just jump in and jump out and catch a quick buck, if there were no risk, then everyone would be in it. And if everyone would be in it, you wouldn't have the upside potential that you do. Well, what about people who are sitting on cash right now? You know, they say, may say, uh, I have $1,000 or 10000 or whatever, the, whatever it is, and I have cash in the bank right now. Yeah. With inflation at right now, latest at 7.9 percent, wh what would you advise people to do that are, are sitting on cash? Uh, is that just eroding? Well, it, it is. I think there are two things I would, I would say in response to that. Number one is that people generally equate risk only in a very narrow sense, capital risk. You put up a dollar and you somehow get back less than a dollar. That's capital risk. But there are other kinds of risks. There is certainly inflation risk or interest rate risk, and that's the risk that over time, higher interest rates rob the value of your portfolio. Uh, there's longevity risk, the risk that your investments are, are returning such an inferior return that over time you have the prospect of outliving your investments. So people should realize if they're sitting in cash, they may be operating under the premise that they're, they're not taking any risk. They're, si they're simply substituting, Andre, one form of risk, capital risk, for another form of risk, and that's inflation risk. And by the same sense that you can't time the stock market and know when to get in and when to get out, you'll never get the interest rate picture just perfectly. You'll never say, geez, Interest rates have just about maxed out. Now it's time for me to load the boat on bonds or make moves accordingly. You have to go in stages and not try to time things. And also, most importantly, apropos of your question, is to have a good understanding of the broad uh, 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 characterizations of what risk really can mean. This inflation news that came out of the 7.9 was for February, which was really basically before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Right. Do you think it's going to get worse before it starts getting better? Because next month, we're going to be having added in the new consumer price indexes, which will involve the beginning of the Russian invasion. Yes, your point is well taken. The inflation indices that we see, and there are a number of them, but just about all of them are trailing measures. It's the equivalent to driving down a highway looking in the rearview mirror. Now, the Federal Reserve frequently looks at uh, a core inflation, as do a number of economists. And core inflation, at least in this point, very conveniently excludes food and energy. So those numbers might not look as ugly. Uh, but I don't know too many people who don't eat and don't drive. Uh, but eventually it will improve because higher prices uh, ultimately cure higher prices. But it may take some time, Andre. That's correct. If I'm the a, a co-owner, a partner of an oil company, and I was in disfavor with government, that they didn't lo they didn't love me a month ago because of the fact of I had oil and gas, fossil fuel. But now all of a sudden they want me to drill, drill, drill. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to be a fair weather friend. How, how should Let's say as an investor who's watching, your clients, whoever, go, well, is oil companies good to be investing in right now? Well, first of all, a lot of energy-related stocks have already had a terrific move up. 
So if you get in here, and again, I'm not a believer in timing, if you get in here, you really have to believe that the prospect uh, is good for uh, meaningfully higher prices, not only in the next week, two or three, because that's a tough way to, to handle your account. That's basically trading, and that doesn't work. You have to believe the outlook for fossil fuel-related products is particularly good down the road. Uh, your point is well taken. Look, the, the current administration, rightly or wrongly, that's for people to decide, uh, has a philosophical aversion towards the uh, development and extraction of fossil fuel resources in this country. Uh, I don't think that's likely to change. It may change a little bit at the margin, but if that were to change in a more meaningful sense, I think the president would have addressed that at his State of the Union, and he's been quite adamant about not doing that. By the time that oil comes to market, it's not a light switch. It might be three, six, nine, twelve months down the road. Perhaps the picture has changed, and also perhaps the administration, while it may be slightly more open to more fossil fuel production today, uh, may have a harsher view six to twelve months from now if the dynamic changes. So I know a lot of people have been hectoring the president to call the oil executives and tell them to drill, 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 and pump, 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 and get the price down for the American people. Uh, I don't know whether he can do that constitutionally, and if he can, I don't know how receptive the executives would be to that for reasons that you just cited. And again, this is the administration's point of view for people to accept or reject, but I do think it's quite clear that's its point of view. This administration, with their new budget, is wanting to add to the defense of the United States and to, de and to defense funding. Well, these defense stocks, and I'm, I'm thinking just offhand, uh, McDonnell Douglas, uh, Raytheon, Boeing, whatever it may be. Yeah. Is this a time also to... I know we just talked about oil and gas and about picking things, but how about defense stocks? Well, uh, again, you cite a very, I think, relevant uh, 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 criterion. They have already moved a great deal. I think one of the things that's coming from the current situation, not just with respect to the U.S., but with respect to the world, or at least the Western world, is that we have to look at the world as it is, not as we'd like it to be. And I think, to some extent, uh, people on both sides of the aisle are engaging in a rather, uh, I think, sober analysis of the risks that we face out there. Uh, you know, since the end of World War II, uh, at least until the last couple of years, maybe the last 10, 15 years, there have been some bumps along the way, but uh, the U.S. basically ran most of the world. Uh, the U.S. certainly was in a position for quite a bit of that 75-year period of time of, of, of hegemony. Uh, it's certainly no longer the case now, and some people would argue we're no longer even in a position of primacy. That obviously remains to be debated. And as a percent of GDP, uh, comparatively over the last 75 years, it's actually historically a bit on the low side. And I think that, in conjunction with what's going on overseas, is causing people to take a step back and say, look, the preeminent requirement of the federal government is the defense of the people of the United States, the protection and defense and maintaining the security of the population. Uh, are we funding that adequately? And I think that's causing a second and third look at, at our defense budget. And are we, uh, you know, are we allocating enough money to it? You shouldn't try to time the market. True. It's uh, because it's the, it's in the length of it. When you already read about it in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, it's already been taken taken place. With Inflation, like what we talked about before, there are some stocks, many stocks, that pay dividends. Do you think dividend paying? Because because I'm thinking of companies can raise their dividends depending on their on their earnings. Do you think dividend paying stocks are, are good areas to to be looking into? Well, obviously, uh, you have to examine why a company is paying a dividend. If a company is paying a dividend because it's prospering, uh, I like that. There are other companies, utilities come to mind, that pay very healthy dividends. But one of the reasons they pay healthy dividends is they're in a highly regulated industry, and there's a limit to how much they can grow. No matter how much they uh, would like to raise rates and raise rates and raise rates, they're regulated from doing that. So one of the reasons utilities pay out large amounts of, of their earnings in the form of dividends is, is for regulatory requirements. Those are basically bond proxies. Uh, there are other companies, uh, based on various areas of the tax code, REITs come to mind, where they're required to pay out a large portion of their earnings in the form of dividends, so people need to understand that. But if you look back over the last, I don't know how many years, dividends have made up uh, a fairly significant percentage of the total return, if they're invested, of the S&P 500. Additionally, as you cite, unlike a bond, unless it's a floating rate bond, 
unlike a bond, companies can raise their dividends, and uh, they have uh, offered some protection against inflationary times. Companies can also raise prices. Uh, so your point about dividend income uh, uh, giving you some protection against higher interest rates and higher inflation, I think, is a sound one. And I think that's certainly something someone should and, 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 and I generally do incorporate into my thought process when looking at a stock. You brought up about, uh, about uh, REITs, which is real estate investment trust and yeah. such. With the, the country getting back to work from uh, we just had, you know, the, the pandemic of Omicron and other types of uh, the, the COVID and such, will, will working back in the office look different? And the reason I ask that is because, like with REITs, some REITs have offices. And I'm curious of whether office REITs will be as, as attractive as they were prior to March of 2020. Well, my thought is this. You have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, but my thought is this, that uh, we're not going to be where we were uh, two years ago, where everyone is working from home because they were compelled to. But I do think some, uh, I don't know if you want to say damage has been done, but some alteration uh, 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 to people's behavior and to the company, to corporate America's willingness to accept those alterations uh, has taken place. And maybe it'll change in 10, 20 years. I'm not smart enough to predict that far down the road. But for the near term, I think some of this is, is here to stay. And by that, I refer to hybrid working, where people uh, are working partially at, in the office uh, and partially at home. Uh, there are some people where I are not only working partially in the office, partially at home, but they actually have relocated to where the, where the, uh, the employer basically says, look, as long as you get your job done, not only do I not care whether you're in the office, I don't even care whether you're two or three miles away. You go live where you <laughs> want to live, uh, just get the work done. But I also think with the passage of time, uh, many employees will, will begin to appreciate, I certainly do, that there's a certain symbiosis, a certain camaraderie, a certain gelling of ideas, a certain critical mass that can really only occur in the office environment. Uh, and that not only has to do with uh, the gestation of, of new ideas, new thought processes, but also building a little bit of esprit de corps. Uh, I have partners with whom I work, and, you know, to have them scattered here, there, and beyond, as was the case initially in the pandemic, is very different. It's workable, but it's very different from having people within earshot of me. And I think over time, people will return. But I don't think we're going back to where we were three years ago, where everyone's in there 40 hours a week, five days. I, I don't think so, Andre, at least not for some time. You've done this for over 40 years. But, you know, for the new people that are just starting out, things that you learn from just from people who have been there sitting at the next desk from you, for, oh, that yeah. have been there for 40 years, there's no, uh, there's no replacement of that, that if you're sitting in your home office, that you can't learn from just being in that, that location. Andre, your... Andre, it's, it's invaluable. I now do it, or I try to do it for younger people, but I remember when I was a younger man. I remember it all the time in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. And I remember when a colleague next door, whom I had befriended, uh, basically made an observation. And he might open the door and say, Jim, you have a minute? Come in here. I want to show you something. That helped me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to quantify it, but it helped me. And it certainly occurred more than once. Uh, if I were 10 miles away on a computer, obviously that option didn't even ex exist. But if it did, uh, the guy isn't going to call me up and say, hey, Jim, I'm just looking at something here and I want to share it with you while you're looking at your screen. Nobody's going to make the call. So I don't know how you value that, but it certainly has a value. And the cumulative effect of those kinds of observations that people were kind enough to make to me over the years, I think has been quite beneficial to me. If you're just joining us right now, we're talking to Jim Spiro. Jim is the managing director at Morgan Stanley. So happy to have him, friend of the show. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. back. We're talking with Jim Spiro, Managing Director at Morgan Stanley. Jim, when we when we left just a, uh, 30 seconds or so ago, we were talking, one of the things we were talking about was the inflation rate and such yeah. that was going on. Well, one thing about inflation, people think of commodities, a.k.a. gold, or 
other things. What are your thoughts on commodities? Well, Mike, one is an obvious thought. It's not a thought. It's a fact. Over the last two, three, four months, they've exploded in value. Uh, there are a lot of people who suggest having some commodity exposure uh, as a long-term uh, uh, component of a portfolio. And I'm not averse to that at all. I understand the arguments for and against it. Uh, looking back over nearly 40 years, as you, as you uh, uh, have suggested, I have found that these things have quick spurts from time to time and quite meaningful spurts, although the last couple of months has been just uh, uh, really historic. Uh, but it, it, if you try to time it and just catch it right, it's almost impossible to do. So you have to have it as a long-term component of your portfolio. You can buy individual uh, uh, commodities. You can have them in the form of an exchange-traded fund. But also realize that if you have a well-balanced portfolio, an S&P 500 or a total market index, most of these companies have some commodity exposure, some uh, on the beneficial side, some on the detrimental side. So you can attack it any way you want. Uh, but over the last couple of months, it's been a great place to be. But I don't know how to be there uh, unless you make it a portion of your portfolio for years and years and years. And for the vast majority of time, I have found that if you do that, there will be some real meaningful spurts. But more often than not, it can be dead money or losing money. Jim, a little while ago, you brought up about bonds. And when it comes to inflation, are, are holding of bonds good for your portfolio or not good? with inflation the way it is? Well, first of all, let's separate bonds as a broad term. It's like, it's like automobile. Could be a station wagon, could be a sedan, could be a sports car. If it's a floating rate bond where the coupon rate adjusts or has some linkage to inflation, that might not be a bad place to be. If it's a fixed rate bond, as most bonds are, and it's a bond of fairly short duration where the sensitivity to higher interest rates is not so, uh, is not so great, that might be a, a good place to be. If it's a long-term bond, uh, and it's a fixed rate bond, then you certainly have to be able to tolerate uh, the likely diminution in market value that you will see on your statement. Uh, that doesn't mean that you won't get paid every six months. If it's a good bond, you will. And it doesn't mean that you won't get paid at maturity when the bond matures. If it's a good bond, you will. But a lot of people's behavior doesn't match their rhetoric. A lot of times, people, when interest rates are low, say to themselves, and some of them say to me, I, I don't want to get a, a, a low yield. What can I get that might give me a higher return? And you say, well, here's what you can do. You can buy a 20- or 30-year bond, but that comes with these commensurate risks. When rates are low and, and the interest rate market is benign, as it has been for the last 15 years or so, many people are willing to just push those aside and say, well, I don't have to worry about that. I'd rather get 3 percent instead of 1. You, most people would rather get 3 instead of 1, but the 3 comes with a set of risks that can rear their head from time to time. And when they do, then, as I said, there's a disconnect between the behavior and the rhetoric. People who say, I don't mind if it goes up or down as long as I'm getting my income, when they see a bond drops 5, 10, 15 percent from their purchase price, then all of a sudden they're not so happy with it. You're willing to tolerate the volatility of a longer-term fixed income instrument. Uh, it was announced this week that Amazon.com uh, is announcing a 20-for-1 stock split. Well, sometimes people go, oh, it's a stock split. Fantastic. Now we can get it. What are your thoughts on companies that offer, uh, whether it be this stock right here or others that, that offer stock splits? Well, there are two kinds of stock splits, Andre. One is probably, I don't know, 90, 95 percent of the time, and it's what I would call a conventional stock split or maybe a stock split. And that's where the number of shares is multiplied and the price is commensurately decreased. So just take an example, ABC company, if they declare a five-for-one stock split, all things being equal, the stock, uh, there will be five times the number of shares outstanding. So if you have one share, you'll receive another four, and the price will adjust to be one-fifth of the price. So no value has been created or removed. It's simply a mathematical exercise. But generally, stock splits of that nature are construed as management's way of saying the company is prospering, and we'd like to reflect that prosperity by reducing the share price so more people can buy uh, a lower price stock. In a reverse stock split, it's generally the converse. It's frequently for regulatory reasons, but a company is perhaps not doing well. Its price has dropped a lot. And either for regulatory reasons, they may be delisted, or management doesn't like the optics of a low price. So in, in the case of a, a one-for-five reverse stock split, people who have one share will have one-fifth of a share, or if they have five shares, they'll end up with one at five times the price. In neither instance is value being created or removed. It's equivalent to a 16-inch pizza. It doesn't serve any more people if you cut it in four, eight, or 16 slices. But a conventional stock split, as we talked about first, is generally seen in a favorable light. A reverse stock split, which is the less common of the two, is generally seen in an unfavorable light. 
I hope you hope you join us again. If you invite me, I'll be happy to do it. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Jim Spiro. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we'd love to hear from you. Make it pithy, make it concise, and write us at Andre at WallStreetWrapUp.info. And now for a look ahead for next week. You know, but first, on this day in 1986, today, this Redmond, Washington company went public. What company was it? We'll have the answer in just a moment. On this day, Redwood Redmond Washington Company went public. Who was it? It was Microsoft. In fact, a $1,000 investment in Microsoft at their IPO price of $21 a share would be worth today over $3,680,000 today. That's a nice return. Well, did you ever think to yourself, I wish I had bought Amazon stock, which closed today, by the way, just under $3,000 a share. But did you ever wish, it, you just, but you just can't afford its lofty price? Well, Amazon has announced this week that they will be splitting their stock 20 to 1. Well, what this means is every share of presently owned Amazon stock, you will get an additional 19 shares. Now, how do stocks perform after splits? Well, Apple split their stock in 2020, and it was up over 35% the following month, and it was up over 54% the following year. So if a, let's say a $2,000 share stock with a 20 to 1 stock split, it's more affordable at $100 a share. But remember, and this is a very important, when a stock splits, you don't get more of a percentage of the company. It's just the pie is split into a, into a smaller pieces. You know, there's an old Yogi Berra saying, the former catcher of the Yankees, when he was presented with a pizza, the waitress asked him if he'd like to her to cut it into fours or would she like to, in eights. And Yogi said, well, you better cut it into fours, I don't think I can eat all eight. Well, that's the same as a stock split. Finally, I bet in school you may have learned that a dime is worth more than a nickel. Not anymore. Well, today a nickel is worth actually more than a dime because there's approximately 25% of nickel in a nickel. Well, the, this week, the cost of the commodity of nickel skyrocketed up because the largest deposits of nickel are in Russia. Why is that important? Nickel is an important element used in the making of electric batteries that the administration, the Biden administration, is pushing us to buy and get away with the combustible fuel engine. So when you save your nickels and dimes, forget the dimes, just concentrate on the nickels. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking with Ambassador Thomas Pickering. Ambassador Pickering represented our country to Russia and to the United Nations. Ambassador Thomas Pickering will be with us in two weeks with an insight and perspective you do not want to miss. And next week on Wall Street Wrap-Up, we'll be talking with the former Under Secretary of Defense and former Commanding Officer of the Army's Elite Delta Force, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. General Boykin served in many leadership positions, including commanding officer of Delta and later Under Secretary of Defense. That's next week, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. And as a reminder, we repeat the show on Sunday mornings, but the best way is to set your DVR so you'll never miss an episode. And that's our show for this Friday, March the 11th, 2022. Hope you enjoyed it. My thanks to Jim Spiro for joining us this evening, but as always, it's you. We appreciate you for allowing us into your homes tonight. Remember, follow us on all the social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and WYES.org. So remember, enjoy your weekend ahead. Have a productive week as well. I'll see you next week. For Wall Street Wrap-Up, I'm Andre Laborde. And remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.